Okay, welcome to the Bucky uh, study group. We're doing Critical Path on uh, February 10th or 11th, depending on what continent you're on. And um, we're going to start reading tonight from page uh, 262 of the Critical Path. And um, um, and so, Richard, uh, you're here tonight. How are you? Or, uh, Manu's here in the morning, and you're here tonight. How are you feeling, and what do you anticipate to get out of today's call? No, I'm doing pretty good. I'm still working away on my uh, uh, search around the concept of ambivalence and how it applies in general and how it applies in suicide situations and looking at the the transition from positive to negative, and, or negative to positive, I should say, and it got me uh, back into the the mathematics of Euler to to try and understand that uh, transition from points to linear to tri triangular. So I'm feeling pretty good, and also this business of uh, the recording for that Barney uh, DeBarco uh, did, and we got permission to see. I just got a note just two seconds ago from Kurt that said, it's there, it's under recording. So I'd have to go back and see uh, whether I can find what's the file on recordings and see if we can locate it. But, okay, and just for the record, what is that linked to? It was a trim tab meeting of a Bucky group and it was on a particular topic. If you want to just, in case you get it, I can put it in a minute. In yeah, a minute. well, I mean, what it was was that um, for the most part, the Trim Tab group does exactly what we're doing, discussing either a topic or, or a particular book. And uh, we had been, uh, which book was it now? I forget, but uh, we finished that up and we had a number of guest speakers that people were interested in, and one of them was Bonnie DeVarco uh, and her early work with, with Fuller and then her more recent work with the uh, uh, the Chronophile Collection at Stanford University. So she agreed to come and talk to uh, the TrimTab group, and she prepared a, an hour-long presentation um with the the slide deck and her own commentary her own narrative and it was a wonderful sort of hour and then there was very active uh q and a dialogue with her for another well over an hour <laughs> um so that was the gist of of um of that recording and having it shared with others i thought it was uh might this be restricted great. just to the trim tab people, but uh, apparently not. Yeah, I did a search, just quick search for Bonnie DeVarco on Google, got her LinkedIn yeah. page, which led to the studio DeVarco, the world of Tony yeah. DeVarco. And uh, I'll put the link to this. You can uh, see the Bucky influences here. And I'll put a link to this uh, page in the... Um, in the chat here and then you're talking about possibly having a link i hope you can get it and i'll put it in the minutes yeah for, I'll... you know and and that can come anytime in the next day or so because i don't i won't send this out for, for yeah little, that's okay yeah really good so that's kind of a little graphic uh comment on what you were discussing there and thank you for sharing and if you want to continue with how you're feeling and your expectations for today that's wonderful well, the ex expectations is to continue to get um, nuggets, if you want, or gems out of uh, the kinds of readings and discussions that we have that take us, take me anyway, uh, a lot deeper into understanding pages that I might have read some time ago and uh, rereading now. So uh, this is... That's what I want to take away, and with just the three of us, and uh, it's room for 
a lot of rich dialogue. Very um, good. So, how are you feeling, Manu? And what are your expectation expectations I feel nice for to today? be in this space this morning? In in this space, I mean this morning. I'm grateful that uh, we made it. Every day is a miracle anyway, because of the richness that you can bring. Really, um, what I'm looking forward to is a further foray into this living re concept and uh, design for living. So that's what uh, I would expect. I think that we had that stage into the book, living re. So that's the big word I would like to explore today and see how in practice, our daily actions or things that we do would uh, would 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 be in a, not alignment, but actually would borrow from that and uh, and 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 and, and uh, how would I say? Well, align with that. Let me put it that way. So that's my expectation. Steve, how do you feel? What do you expect? Um. I'm um I'm impressed or frustrated or overwhelmed <laughs> or all three of those things <laughs> because uh we're looking at a time that seems to be where things have become so critical for for human beings on this planet political everything seems to be moving off to an extreme the with the advent of AI um with the advent of the um the kind of nationalist political movements, the populist movements that are occurring all over the world. And it seems to me that um, everybody's distracted from the major problem. And the major problem is, at least in America that I see, is everybody thinks that they have to make a million dollars in order to help people. And Bucky decided long ago that you either make money or you make sense. And, you know, his premise is that everybody's a billionaire and that the grunge of the giants, and I have to say that my estimation is the ignorance of people just in general, um, which allow the grunge of the giants to continue. I mean, Bucky sh has charts showing how technology creates more and more wealth and how uh, as power production increased on the planet earth population decreased and that as people become more um as they become more um economically viable and as their life becomes easier they focus more on education they get less they get fewer kids and it seems like all these things are happening that he talked about and nobody is stepping forward you know his big thing is he's he can't convince anybody politically to do anything right, he just believes in creating a better mousetrap, that if you create the right technology and the right system and make it prevalent that people will do it without having to be politically convinced of it. And I see all those systems rising now, you know, TikTok and, um, and AI and um, electric cars and, uh, you know, and this push for sustainable and maybe even, although the term regenerative, I think is just starting to enter in the vocabulary. Um, so I got a, uh, a link this week from somebody who on a TED talk where one of the big themes in international economics is that we've got to stop focusing on quarterly growth and start focusing on some other kind of criteria to measure our success. And the idea in that particular TED talk was about thriving instead of growing. We need to thrive instead of grow. And it seems like all this growth is that is causing the problem. So, you know, here's Bucky predicting all these things. And uh, in 1985, here we are 45, 50 years later, and we got the same problems only exacerbated. I think Bucky would roll over in his grave to see what we've done with this. And I wonder how patient he would be. So, you know, I'm happy just to plod along and see what new gems I can get out of out of reading this, uh, out of our continued reading. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, what's that, yeah. Richard? Well, I'm, I, I certainly 
connect with what you just said. And uh, it brings me back to uh, my early introductions of Fuller's work to the students of social work back in the 70s and the 80s. But in, in 1987, one of my students wrote a, a futurist paper based on Fuller's thinking. Um, and she, she said it in the context of a speech that was going to be given in 2026 at the 100th anniversary of the social work discipline in Canada. And mm -hmm. then the next term, um, I was sort of caught up with this idea of Fuller's like uh, um, spending, you know, uh, what what's the title of his his talk about you know but everything I know about universe kind of thing, right? So I said to the next class of students, um, or the next term, I said, why don't we pool all of what you've been learning, and I'll try and pool all of what I've been learning into one sort of grand paper that will still be this futurist paper based on the the adoption of Fuller's sort of thinking by the turn of the century. So by 12 years hence. Um, and so, you know, um, acid rain is, was gone and people were working together in the way in which he said is the function of the human being. And it's a very glowing report in terms of the way the world is going to be in 2026. <laughs> and uh, of course, I'm getting awfully close to actually attending that lecture. <laughs> uh, and when I reread his work, I I read what you've just said. It's like the the world seems to continue to go to hell in a handbasket, and uh, <clears throat> there. Whenever that paper gets released, if you want, or somebody actually delivered it in 2026, the audience is going to laugh them out of the room. I'm saying, but the critical thing is, is that the reason it's going to be like that is because the profession did not adopt Fuller's work at the turn of the century. Right. Uh, uh, in reality, it, it has not happened. And. Yeah. Uh, and so we're going to get what we get uh, in in two years' time. Yeah, I think I think one of the things is that we always read Bucky's word, forgetting about the first principle, and the first principle is that of duality. And the duality of this is this way. Okay, I put up one a sentence that we're going to read. A page later, later after this, what Bucky said. That is the glowing side of it, what can be. Right? But we always forget that there is the dark side of it, and that we are the fulcrum. Mm -hmm. We are the fulcrum. We are, you know, you have two things like this, and we are there in between. And what do we do at the forefront? That's what he say. That's why he say. The final examination is that of the individual. It's nice to read to say, okay, I'm going to have all of this information. We have that information now. And as Steve was saying, what are we doing of it? You get what I'm trying to say here. Mm -hmm. So all Becky does is is that there is precession, and precession is extreme leverage. That's, in my, in my understanding, that's what it is. It is extreme leverage, but there's still a fulcrum of that leverage. What are we doing of a homicide? Right? We are that fulcrum, that point of flow of energy. Mm -hmm. How do we deflect it? How do we use it? How do we decide to make of it? And that's exactly the point where we are today. And that's why we, there are questions that, in spite of all of this abundance in terms of information, in terms of knowledge, why is the world 
going the way it is going. Yeah. So that's a rhetorical question, right? <laughs> yep. That that is to say that you know, Belki wrote about abundance. He said the greatest luxury in the world is to be able to live unencumbered while able to get any information you want in split second and at any desirable environmental condition you want in a day. The part that we forget is unencumbered. Are we unencumbered? Yeah. yeah. And, and that is a big decision of the individual. Yeah. Are you unencumbered? Do you hold to the old things or do you let go? some of those for the sake of better discovery of things to come. Yeah. And yeah. it's written that you want, you want to go to the top of a mountain, you have to let go some of the stuff. Yeah. You have to just have your, your, your sack, your bag, and then, and then be as light as you can to be climbed, to be able to climb uh, the Everest Mountain. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing. I mean, if if I'm going to go somewhere unencumbered, then it behooves me to um, facilitate that you can go somewhere unencumbered. <laughs> and uh, and so. Uh, But that, I mean, going back to Malthu uh, Malthusian times and earlier, but Malthusian is a good one since that's the one Fuller always talks about, is, is that he set up that sort of paradigm that said, look, um, there's not enough to go around to feed everybody or to give everybody that unencumbered sort of life. And so... Um, there are going to be the um, the castoffs, um, and that and uh, being got interpreted in the social context by Spencer and perhaps by Darwin, and or at least the way he was interpreted in terms of the the uh, competitiveness in evolution, um, and so we've ended up with this every man for himself, every nation for itself, uh, every culture for itself. Um, I mean, that's not true, you know, across the board, but, but even those who want to foster unencumbered ways of living just get stamped on uh, or stomped on. <laughs> um, even when you, well, um old ways of knowing that that were pretty good in many ways uh have been buried and some of them are resurfacing and um but somehow or another we've got this idea that um uh, and to me it's an overemphasis on the end on the individual um in the capitalist western world and in the communist commune world it's an overemphasis on the collective and the hell with the individual <laughs> mm. um and the um the solution <laughs> is to have a co-equality between the individual and the and the collective mm -hmm. um because the two always coexist. Yeah, yeah. We ignore the coexistence of the yeah. two. Yeah. And we become ideological, yeah. completely ideological. And that's the, actually the biggest debate today. It's not about capitalism and socialism. It is about the responsibility of the individual and the responsibility of the collective and yeah. how the two interplay. It's a little it's subtle, but a little bit different in my opinion. Well, even for me and my discipline, and, and I know this is true in lots of other disciplines and, and cultures, 
the principle of self-determination is, is paramount and important. Um, whether it's sovereign uh, determination or individual. But when you look at it, for the most part, it's not literal. It's not, you can do everything you want. There's always a caveat that says uh, self-determination up to a point. You can't override somebody else's self-determination. Um, and that, that by definition removes it from self-determination in the pure sense. Right. Um, there's, there's others who have the right to that same determination that you have to take into account. And so self-determination for me, like sunsets and sunrises, is a bad word because <laughs> it, it, um, it casts off a, a different meaning than what was really intended. But um, Richard, it comes to the social geometry structure of a language. Mm -hmm. Let me abuse words that are repetitive. But structure means boundary is a mm -hmm. prerequisite. People have to speak in the way to say under this, 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 and those conditions. Yeah. Then, but we never take that pain in our language to explain it that way. No, in the same way we, you know, when we say boundary and we even think of the human being, well, boundary on you and me is the membrane of our skin. Um, and it's porous, it's not solid, yes, yes, it's yes, not yes, firm. Yes, yes. And so the, the, the porousness um, is often not uh, articulated when we talk about the importance of boundary. Boundary often means uh, keep people out <laughs> or lock people in. <laughs> and uh, the hell with the porousness of uh, between cultures or between people or, yeah, it, it's... <laughs> um, but that's why... Kelly was trying these things. For example, you will say boundary, space, time, timing, forward, mm -hmm. to have a meaning. You see, you say boundary, then you create a space. Mm -hmm. And then there's energy flow. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a question of time, cycle, and timing the valve, open, close, boundary, control. So he, he, he had that effort. I don't know if, if it, I don't know what uh, Steve will say about it, but we try for a while to always kind of have what we call a quadri word, a forward stuff to meaning something. Mm. So that you don't try to explain a concept just in one word. The minimum was four. Right. But that, that, that requires, you know, effort to check your language. Yeah. To be clear when you are expressing things. Yeah. There's another aspect of this, and I've been putting some comments in the, in the uh, box here, because we're talking about social boundaries in a way. And there's a lady who uh, has done, written a book called... Um, Oh, shoot. It's called, um, gee, I don't have any reference to the book. I have reference to the movie here. I'll get a reference yeah. to the book. Yeah. Uh, the book is called, uh, the movie is called Origin. And the book is called, um, let me see, Fresh Air Weekend, Ava uh, du Duvarney uh, has done this movie based on the book called uh, uh, a book will, written by Isabel Wilkerson. Right. And it's on caste. And it's just basically on inferiority and superiority. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's, it's the idea that it goes way deeper than race. That mm -hmm. race is the thing that everybody goes on. But there is something in the human brain that that sets up and allows somebody to be inferior. 
and she addresses that and talks about how that was the roots of how the Germans uh, actually legally built a construct in Nazism to build the um, concentration camps to actually eliminate the Jews. And they came to America and studied the South and a particular yeah. book called Deep South, written by some Harvard um, uh, anthropologists who went into Missouri undercover and started documenting uh, racism. And the Germans actually structured their laws against Jews based on the theories that were actually implemented in, in Southern, uh, in, in the South in America. And then she even goes one step further and investigates the caste system in, in uh, India and actually has a scene where she's documenting where human beings go into public toilets and their job is to clean the, uh, the, the fecal matter out of the public toilets to keep the public toilets working. And the untouchables are the people who do that. Mm -hmm. And how that the whole caste system just sees people down there and goes, well, that's their calling in life. You know, I'm superior, they're inferior. And boy, when you look at system, when we go that that deep into psychology, and one of the things she points out in her book, um, and I haven't put the name of the book there yet either. It's called, uh, um, I'll get the name of the book. Caste is only the part of the name of the book. And um, uh I got so worked up on finding that book name that I I lost the thought I was thinking. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get the the um, book. Here's the title. It's coming up right now. Bam, and it's called. Um, it's called. Um, oh, this is I. Of course, I click on the wrong book. Here it is. Oh, the origins of our discontents. Mm -hmm. cast the origins of our discontents yeah an eye-opening story of people history and the re-examination of what lies underneath the surface of ordinary lives uh <clears throat> anyway uh it's just a, so we have all these prejudices to get over so let's begin our reading and see if we can get some insights um on uh, on this if we're all complete with our share and discussion let's uh, move ahead and uh i'm a big one for uh rotating reading um what happened to the book? Oh, here it is right here. Okay, good. So I'll even start and then we'll rotate around and uh, Richard and Manu, we can all read tonight. I'll read two or three paragraphs and we'll go from there. I will now discuss the pro the probable order of living reoriented realization of the socioeconomic results of our already accomplished, already accomplished half century critical path artifacts development. I will discuss the operationally introduced sequence of their realizations in terms of the many critical path relevant subjects that I also have introduced through this book. For instance, we have pointed out that the geologist, you could probably say that word. Um, um, see, so yeah, I knew you could say that. Uh, the Chardonnay. Charnedes. I think it's Francois because he's not Francois. Okay. I see. And in fact it is. It's the not it's the C with the thing or underneath it, not yes, the G. Francois in French. Yeah. So I'm gonna put a C there, but I'm sure that there's a way for me to insert a symbol to do that, but I'm not gonna take the time to do that. Um, wrote uh, for me a scenario of the technology of nature's producing petroleum, which disclosed that the amount of energy employed by nature as heat and pressure for the amount of time required to produce each gallon of petroleum, if paid for at the rate at which the public utilities now charge retail customers for electricity, must cost over a million dollars a gallon. By the way, uh, the only reason why we have coal is because fungi for 300, for I think 300,000 years, fungi had not learned how to digest plant fiber. And so uh, the plant fiber just sat there being compressed over time. And then later fungi learned how to eat the, fun, uh, the uh, plant fiber. And if the fungi had been there in the first place, there'd be no petroleum, there'd be no coal on our planet, which is kind of interesting. Um, a million dollars a gallon. Combine that with information with the discovery that approximately 60% of the employed in U.S. America 
are working at tasks that are not produced by life support, that are not producing any life support. Jobs of inspectors of inspectors, jobs with insurance companies that induce people to bet their house on going to be destroyed by fire while the insurance company bets that it isn't. All these are negative preoccupations. Jobs with the underwriting of insurance underwriters by other insurance underwriters, people checking up on one another in, in, an, um, in the all different departments of the treasury, internal revenue, FBI, CIA, and encounter espionage. About 60% of all humanity, human activity in America is not producing any physical life protection, life support, or development <coughs> accommodation, which physical life support alone constitutes real wealth. Um, he would have a heart attack, Bucky would have a heart attack seeing the financial crisis of 2008. And the epitome of that was here was Wall Street was creating all these uh, instruments and then betting they were not and betting they were going to fail and insuring themselves so that if they did fail, they'd be covered by insurance. And as a result, out of that two, 2008 financial crisis, the U.S. government actually asked to bail out the insurance companies who paid off all the Wall Street companies for betting on the fact that their securities were going to fail. So Wall Street came out on top and uh, he, Bucky would turn over in his grave. I'm going to read this one paragraph and then we'll move to the next page and somebody else can read. The majority of Americans reached their jobs by automobile probably averaging four gallons a day, thereby each is spending four million real cosmic physical universe dollars uh, a day without producing any physical universe life support wealth accredited to their energy time. Metabolic, accounting system in eternally governing regenerative universe. Humans are designed to learn how to survive only through trial and error one knowledge. Long knows uh, long known errors are, however, no longer cosmically tolerated. The 350 trillion cosmic dollars a day wasted by the 60% of no wealth producing human job holders in the USA, together with the 19 quadrillion a day wasted by the no wealth producing human job holders in all other automobiles to work countries, also can no longer be cosmic cosmically tolerated. Wow. Who wants to read? Richard, do you want to go from here? Sure. Uh, today, uh, we have computers that are, enable us to answer some very big questions if all the relevant data is fed into the computer and all the questions are properly asked. As for which would cost society the least to carry on as at present, trying politically to create more no wealth producing jobs or paying everybody handsome fellowships to stay at home and save all those million dollar gallons of petroleum. Stated ever more succinctly, the big question will be, which costs more? Paying all the present job holders a billionaire's lifelong $400,000 a day fellowship to stay at home, or having them each spend $4 million a day to commute to work. Every computer will declare it to be much less expensive to pay people not to go to work. The same computers will also quickly reveal that there is no way in which each and every human being could each day spend $400,000, staying at the most expensive hotels and doing equally expensive things. They could, could rarely spend 4,000 of the 1980 deflated dollars a day, which is only 1% of a billionaire's daily income. Why would all the people not continually buy all kinds of expensive things? Answer, because they will want to travel around the world. They will quickly discover that while you can't take it with you into the next world, you also can't take it with you around this world. They will each discover for themselves that the greatest luxury in the world is to be able to live unencumbered while, being a, while able to get any information you want in split seconds and any desirable environmental condition you want in a day. Of course, that's what Manu put in the chat. Yeah. It's a preview of what we were reading. Right. So the uh, actuarial curve indicates an eight-year life expectancy, an 80-year life expectancy to 2000 AD. 
this amounts to 700,800 700, hours per lifetime. I would like to make some assumptions regarding the future use by humans of those hours. I'm assuming the present average is the 40 hour work week and 49 work weeks per year. This amounts to 156,800 potential birth to death work hours per lifetime. If we spend only 40 of our 80 years at work, that would be 78,400 lifetime work hours. As of our present lifestyle, we would be giving 11% of our lifetime to work in producing for self or for others. For instance, a four day work week of five hours per day with a three day weekend would result in living in the same spot and clogging up the highways with local weekend to and froing. We now propose instead of chopping life into work week increments that we consolidate our work service potential into a few years of. Mm. Sorry, mm. I'm following along in the book. I'm following along the book, didn't realize I wasn't watching the page. Um, a few we... years of, of continuous six day per week, eight hour per day service as in the military or medical internship. Assuming that as a result of technological advances, the machines can produce adequate life support in half the present time, present day custom would adopt a three day, five hour per day work week. This means that 20 hours per week is all that is necessary to attend the machines that accomplish adequate life support production. The internship service concept is composed of an eight hour per day, six day work week, and a total of 48 hours per week. Because of mechanical advance, we are now assuming that the 40 hour week is reducible to a 20 hour work week. This means that our original required lifetime work service of 78,400 hours has though, as through technical advance, been reduced to 36,200 lifetime work hours. At the constant intern service of 48 hours per week, the 36,200 hours of lifetime production can be accomplished in 754 weeks or 14 and a half years. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, Any comments or questions? We'll switch well, over Andrew, if you want to read. Go ahead, Richard. Do I keep cutting you off? No, I'm just, I mean, the, the, the comment is, um, uh, having read this part years ago and and being an advocate of of um, guaranteed annual income coming out of uh, out of this kind of reading, and everybody thinks it's a joke. I mean, they think that um, just like Malthus thought, um, you have to work to earn a living. Um, which goes against the the fundamental value that so many of us say is is that everybody is got fundamental self worth. Everybody has fundamental integrity, uh, and have a right to be on this earth. But this kind of thinking says no way. You you're expendable if you can't work those forty hours a week, um, and. Uh, and you're expendable if you do not earn your living. Um, whereas Fuller is saying in this kind of writing, you don't have to earn anything. Uh, and the world is so rich that we could give you this kind of income and you go do what you want. And he always argued too, I, I haven't heard it quite come out yet in this reading, that those who want to work to contribute and so forth will do so um, and uh, you'll get a relatively small number of people producing an awful lot that can be distributed to everybody and there will be no jealousy over the fact that i'm sitting on a beach somewhere and you're working your ass off because that's what you want to do <laughs> right so anyway i, I get I make a comment here? Just, yeah okay so let's assume that you work 20 hours a week. 
or 24 hours a week. That everybody works 20, 24 hours a week and everybody has an income, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But a complement of work to make a structure is sleep, is think and is social cohesion. Work, sleep, think, social cohesion. How would that work here? Because the assumption I guess that Bucky is making is that everybody knows how to think. No. We have today information at the tip of our fingers. But who thinks? We've seen like, see, we're talking about TikTok, <laughs> about, uh, about Facebook, about all of these social media. We're just spending time trying to clear the memory of our devices. Because you receive all of these things sent many, many times. It's taking of your time and things like that. And then you are attracted in order to be socially accepted, to think, to do like the other guys are doing, just sending the, those things around. So when do you think? So if and you are sending those things around, they, they form patterns that interfere with social cohesion and acceptance and peace. So where does it take us? Well, yeah. Are you complete with that? Yes. All right. And there's the other factor here that if I'm working 40 hours a week and I'm getting in my car and driving to work every day, I had to buy a car. I have to buy the fuel. There's other products I have to buy in order to stay in that cycle. So I'm actually just consuming a bunch of goods to maintain a lifestyle when, as Bucky points out here, that's just a rut that people are in. The Native Americans didn't do that. I mean, you Native Americans were involved daily in finding purpose in their own lives. They had vision quests and, you know, they would follow, often many tribes would follow the buffalo, at least that's the stereotype, but they were great farmers, and the Navajo were great farmers, and they had uh, even this, even the Lakota had stockpiles of food that they we, they would move into an area, they'd farm the area or harvest the stuff they'd planted the year before, and mm -hmm. then they'd store those foods and then move on to the next place and let nature just provide for them. Uh, one of the big things that the American Cavalry did, the U.S. Cavalry, in order to get um, in order to li eliminate the Indians, they went and had to find their stockpiles of food and they'd go, uh, you know, rob and uh, uh, those stockpiles in order to create a starvation situation for yeah. the Native Americans. Um, and yeah. we we have this, you know, it's really imperialism. We have this idea that we're, we're not slaves, but we got to go to work. We got to earn our right to be here on the planet. And of course, yeah. Bucky's thinking out how silly that is. Yeah. But I'm just saying that the the basic tenet of Bucky's thought is violated every day in that we don't think globally enough. Yeah. We don't start globally enough. If you don't start globally enough, there's always going to be conflict. And that and that if you if there are conflicts, there are going to be opportunities for confiscations of things that to have contributing to living with. And turning them into, into a ransom, right? Like 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 Steve was saying, in that you are a slave without knowing that you are a slave. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my own it wasn't a personal connection, but it was a personal awareness when I spent six months in India. Um, and to know that they street vendors in downtown Bombay, Mumbai, um, 
couldn't afford to live uh, in the city. And many of them were living four hours out of the city by train. And so they would come, take four hours to come in, spend eight hours at, on, at their vendor, street vendor uh, stall, then four hours back home at 16. And the rest, the other eight hours was probably to me, to eat and socialize a little bit and get sleep and start it all over again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that is every day. Every, every day. day, every day. Oh my God. And I mean, there's millions of stories of people doing something similar, whether it's having to walk five miles to get water and come back or uh, whatever. It it just it all is not so in many ways, and yet it. You know, if you picked up on Bucky's idea, it's that it put four hundred thousand uh, dollars in everybody's pocket every year, and uh, we would have just as much success and just as much growth, or just as much um, uh, livingry as we do now. We'll probably have more, according to him. But yeah, Mano, do you want to read? We are now going to assume a college or university level education available to all humans, probably to be effected through a stay at home, video call up procedure involving six years in all. We assume that there is a great advantage to the individual of having work years experience intervening between the bachelor degree and the graduate work. We assume entry into bachelor work at 18 years of, old, uh, of age. The, this means that at 20 years, at 21 years of age, a student can enter open their internship production service consisting of 48 hours work with weeks. The student will then enter open four years of this total 14 and a half years of production service responsibility. This brings them to the age of 25. They will then enter upon the three year of graduate work greatly informed by their production work years. At 28, the graduate student will enter upon the final 10 years of production service. At 38, they will have completed the service in direct production support of humanity. With their wisdom probably evolved, they will have more they have their lives still to live. They will be extremely well informed. They will be free to initiate their own mind-informed commitment to the improvement of human functioning in support of the eternal regenerative integrity of the universe. I just want to point out that the male brain matures at around 28 years old. Uh, the recent new science is showing that the male brain matures at 28. So a person would have done all this work, their brain will be maturing, and now they can start living a productive life with a mature brain. I just thought I would point mm. that out. <laughs> cool. You want to continue, Manu? Yeah, it is very probable that the technological advances will be far greater than those of the foregoing assumptions. At present, all the great new city office buildings are fancy plumbing, with which only the typewriters sleep while a majority of city people sleep in inferior quarters with poor plumbing. The moment we start giving everyone those and some life fellowship, we find almost all the great new business buildings in the city being depopulated to such an extent that we shall in quick order be able to turn those buildings into great apartment houses and hotels to accommodate the free will residential convergences of humanity in central cities. Although such uh, skyscrapers are far less efficient than the ultimate city buildings, they will provide a satisfying step forward in accommodating humanity successi successively occurring desires and needs to deploy into wilderness country of archaeological research country or sport country, or to converge to meet with other humans for conferences 
or the collateral development of which there will be a never multiplying exciting availability. You guys, there was, I just saw a great video, and I think Joe sent it to me, about conversion, converting office buildings into residences and what a problem it is. Because a residence needs windows, and most of the office buildings are just cubby holes where they're forcing ventilation through uh, through the walls. And what they're having to do in some of these, they're, they're doing conversions on some of these office buildings. Some they say they're not able to convert, but the ones they are, they go into the midsection of the building and they just tear everything down and they create a giant atrium in there. That, and then that gives them exterior windows that would normally have been on the inside of the building. And there, I, I will, um, I'm, <clears throat> I'll look for that, uh, uh, the converting office building. I wish Joe were here. He'd know exactly where it was and he could put it in there. But there's a big but thing. Say again, say again, Steve, you say they created an atrium in the middle. and yes. Yeah, and put windows in it. And so, ah, okay. the, so there's a giant tube in the middle of a building. They just tear everything out, all the floors and everything. And then they put windows so that it ends up being like an atrium in there. I hope I've explained it right. And not all buildings are suited for that kind of uh, of re repurposing. Um, so, but it addresses this very thing about whether uh, office buildings could be converted into hotels and apartment buildings. Yeah. I'll, I'll do what I can to find converting office link and I'll see if I can put that in the uh, thing. We're also looking for the, um, the link from um, from Richard on um, on the Bucky is it is a big problem currently, right? Say what? It is a big problem. Oh, it's a the huge problem. of of housing. Yeah, and so the housing is a problem. We got homeless people up the yin yang here in America. Plus the fact that because of uh, COVID, people learn they can work from home. And there's still a good 25 to, I want to say 50% of, of, of workers who either work from home or have the right to work from home. Uh, some people like Elon Musk are saying, hey, if you have a job, come, in, come to work like I do. And he sleeps at work, of course, uh, you know, and his, his, his businesses are really mission driven. So uh, Elon doesn't like um, people who work at home, but there is a big trend for that. Mm. And we're Absolutely. and we're doing what we can to find an equilibrium for it. Okay. Want to read another paragraph there, Manu? Yes. Along with making it economically feasible to permit a large majority of people to remain at home in country or city, to think fearlessly and unselfishly, we will permit all children to study at home, eliminating the schoolhouse, school teachers, school genitals, school bus systems which cost unnecessary trillions of dollars world around, world around each school year. At home, we shall provide each child with a private room, television set, a video education cassette, a video education cassette, as well as world satellite interrelate computer and controlled video encyclopedia access. These will make it possible for any child anywhere to to obtain lucidly, faithfully, and attractively presented authoritative information on any subject. Students will be able to review the definition and explanation of several authorities on any given subject, as there are different viewpoints of a number of great scholars on any given subject. The system will never get tired of answering the questions or even the same questions asked and as and answered until the child is sure that he or she has understood. To make children ever more confident of their understanding and useful enjoyment of their thought, each will be given access to basic tools and direct experiences in the purposeful use of the tools. Children and grown-up people will be able to get their continuing intellectual education at their home terminal. They will get their social experience and tool handling education in locally organized neighborhood activities when human wish to converge. 
You see, this is this goes right along with Bucky's whole thing. You'll never have you'll never create this change politically or through education. You have to create it by just creating the right kind of tools and people will use those tools. You know, they were doing a lot of Zoom calls and stuff like that until COVID hit and the video conferencing was having trouble getting in there because people like to go face to face with people. But when COVID hit, all of a sudden they found out they really didn't need to do that. And um, that's one of those emergencies that create a, a huge change in social uh, conditioning. And so, wow. And everything he's saying here is, of course, coming around. By the way, I found the, um, I found the, um, um, I found the video. Here it is right here. I, I think it's worth it's worth watching. I'll, I'll just we, we want to read Bucky as much as we can. Uh, but this is a um, are you a Rocky Mountain Power? Well, customer? that's the uh, commercial. I was thinking about um, actually These people don't. Um, OK, good. So here it is. And it's 60 minutes. I think it's 60 minutes Australia. And the whole segment is only six minutes long. But it talks about the the conversion of these office buildings and what the restrictions are and what the problems are. I'm going to take that and stick it in the chat right now. And, um, and why we'll can we watch that? You would you want to watch it? I think that I don't know what Richard thinks. Sure, Richard, what do you think? Yeah, it's five five minutes. It's six minutes. Right. That's fine. Let's, let's do it. We'll take six minutes and uh, let me see. I'm showing. And I'm sharing sound, and here we go. Schools, perimeter offices, um, very dimly lit, and uh, and just you know jam packed with uh, paper. This week on 60 Minutes, our piece is about the commercial real estate crisis, particular office buildings. What happens to all these skyscrapers when people are not going to the office five days a week and interest rates are at historic highs? At the same time, there is this housing crisis where, on the one hand, the, the residential market is prohibitively high. The obvious question is, why not convert some of these empty offices into housing, into affordable housing in particular? Imagine we have a building that's worth $100 million. We met Stan Van Neuerberg, who's one of the world experts on, on real estate. He's a professor of real estate at Columbia Business School. How many of these office buildings can realistically be converted to housing? So we've looked into this in our research, and we end up at a number around 10 to 15 percent of office buildings. It sounds distressingly low. It's a low number because there's a lot of obstacles, right? A lot of these modern office buildings from the 70s and 80s have an enormous footprint, and it's really hard to, to convert these office buildings, bring light and air into the interior of the space, have enough plumbing have windows that operate. So there's a lot of engineering obstacles to converting these buildings. It's not as easy as it sounds. That's right. When you say convert, are you talking about air and light and running gas lines, or are we talking about demolition and then rebuilding them as apartments? When I say convert, I mean repurpose. We keep the original structure. Uh, we change the facade. We change the interior. We might have to do more radical surgery and insert air wells into the middle so that we have more windows and more light coming into the building. None of this is cheap, but a lot of it is doable. For a lot of buildings, this is a feasible process. Does the math work? I mean, can you convince the building owner to do it? So, you know, that sort of gets us to a second set of obstacles, which are financial obstacles, right? Does the math work out? We're not talking about creating affordable housing. If you want to create affordable housing, then, you know, rents are naturally going to be lower. And so the math typically does not work out anymore. So we have eight units total on this floor, a mixture of two beds, one beds, and studios. What, is, what are they rent for? Anywhere from $3,500 from the studios up to $7,500 on the two beds. A month? A month. We went to a property in, in Lower Manhattan developed by the Van Barton Group where they've taken this office building where the tenancy is dropped and they've taken conference rooms and cubicles and they're tra transforming the entire building into apartments. And it is not a task you, you undertake lightly, but they have figured out the math. Rods, they go up. Joey Colelli works for the Van Barton Group. Where are we? 
for 160 Water Street in the Financial District in New York. What did it used to be? HHC, uh, so Health and Hospitals with New York City, as well as Beth Israel, some of the back office. Why the decision to turn this to residential? When we looked at the, the state of the market in 2020 and some of the lease expirations and, and some of the consolidation that some of the office tenants wanted to do, the highest and best use was to go residential. We're learning that these buildings are, are bought and built with a lot of loans. Can I ask how much do you owe on this building? So we actually took out a, a loan for $273 million uh, to do this uh, construction. That's the price tag to convert this? That is. How many units? So 588. What does a converted building have to do to attract tenants? Well, they have to add amenities. Some of these are what you'd expect from an apartment building, the fire pit on the roof and the nice deck. Even the roof changes. Yes, exactly. Some of this, ironically enough, is to make it accessible and friendly to remote work. So you're sort of accelerating this trend of remote work and work from home. What's the role of work from home when you're converting a building like this? There are certain components that uh, went into our design thinking, whether those were home offices, to some of the co-working spaces that we have planned on our uh, uh, roof deck amenity, where there are Zoom rooms and other conference rooms um, for people to, to book. So you're not just converting office space into residential. You're building the residential so people never have to go to the office. Well, there's definitely a, a dynamic um, shift that's been out, out there. And whether it's one or two days uh, a week when people are working from home, we want them to be able to find a space outside of their unit and to be able to enjoy that space or even invite coworkers over for that collaborative time in this building. One thing that became clear to this story, real estate, it, it goes up and it goes down and there's booms and there's busts, but what's going on now with Zoom and hybrid work compounded by these interest rates is that this is more than just a market dip. This is really this, this inflection point where we are asking ourselves some fairly existential questions about space and real estate and cities and what the future holds. Stan Van Neuerberg leavens that with this idea that, look, this is a chance to redefine what a city is and reconceive of how we use space. It is an opportunity. Cities have always reinvented themselves as long as they have existed. And this is a moment of transformation. We got to, you know, re-energize our cities, make them vibrant. It's crucial for the American economy, for its productivity, for its growth. I want to believe in the future of this city, but it will not happen without hard work. Pairing this ingredient with water. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. All right. Is it okay? You hear me? Yeah. I I was oh. muted. Um. Okay. So, so what I I mean I have some stuff that are quite interesting is that you say that the cost of that project, they had a loan, assuming that everything was loan finance. Yes. They had a loan of $278 million. Yes. For 588 units, I think. So the average financial burden of a unit that is, I guess, a bachelor of uh, maybe uh, you know, 200 square feet, probably, will be $472,000. Per unit. Right? Yes. Yeah. Now, now, that is for New York. And then you have to that, compare that to remote working to building a new city with those specs somewhere. Yeah. And then having people being there and working. Or for people or people working from home, from where they are. 
it's quite staggering. I mean, 400, and then you talk about the rent. The rent started at $3,000. At $3,500 a month for the cheap ones. Yes. So that is over 40000 a year. Yeah. So that would require that if you have a rule of, say, I wouldn't say I'll say one seven today. It require earnings of three hundred thousand dollars to just afford the bachelor, right? Yep. That's yeah. hard. That's hard, and I have another podcast I can let you hear where the guys are talking about the financial crash coming in office buildings because there's so much vacancy in office buildings the the banks they don't and they're not creating rent therefore the income value of the property is lower they're not qualifying for a refinance and so and that's because the interest rates they have on their loans this whole thing is exacerbated because the interest rates they currently have in their loans are at two and three and four percent and the interest rates have gone up. So to refinance right now, they're at seven to eight to nine percent to refinance right now. As a result, and they're and they're vacant and their loans are coming due. <laughs> so most of the banks are just doing forbearances for another six months, trying to push the the due date down because if they are forced to refinance right now based on the income value of the property, those properties are worth 40% of what they were worth when the loans were taken out five years ago. So but that is a consequence of the great voodoo economics that we've been subject to. Yeah. That the real income, the real income of people has steadily gone this down. You bet. And, and then people are talking the about cost growth. of their mortgages have been going up. Yes. <laughs> the cost yeah. has been going, you know, like because what is important is the ratio of cost to income or income to cost. That's what is important. That's what we have to follow. We don't follow disjointly the cost of living and the income. It is a ratio. Because it's that ratio, that interplay, that determines the comfort of living. Or is it becoming more and more affordable? Or is it becoming more expensive? And the and the, and the, the picture is that for the past 50 years, it's become more and more expensive. And everybody is now experiencing it, whether it's a developed country. Or developing country, it is similar. The nominal income in Canada in the US that are to people like us is there. But the cost of living, it doesn't translate into the real thing that you expect in terms of quality of life and things like that. It is hard for everybody. It's very hard. And you mentioned a cost of living. That's cost of living in the standard Western way of living, going to work 40 to 60 hours a week and spending all that extra overhead in non-productive work. Yes. At, yes. Which Bucky talks about and addresses here too. Yeah. So it's all mm -hmm. exacerbated. Any other comments? And the guy talk about growth. You see, it's, you know, this word growth all the time, it's very misleading. Yeah. What about... Reducing costs. Yeah. Because we always talk about growth. That is just looking at the side of the output. Mm -hmm. Growth, 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 growth. Yeah. But what about this? Reducing the cost. Yeah. We will okay. have the same, we will have the same effect anyway. Yeah. This has inspired me to find that link. I'm gonna find that link and put it in our chat was the idea of having a thriving economy versus a growth economy and the difference between thriving and growth and how growth actually hurts thriving mm -hmm. with the emphasis on growth. Any other comments or questions? All right. Let's well, again, the, the other thing that at, at another level, but those who are, are critical of the UN's uh, sustainability goals and are coming in and saying that's not going far enough. And those who are arguing for regeneration as the goal, which is really all about thriving and doing it in a way that thriving 
carries on over time, just the way Bucky defined the regenerative, the integrity of the regenerative universe. So even even with all that um, high end, if you want, intelligence and thinking that goes into producing something like a sustainability document with 17 goals, the critical thinker comes along and says, well, that's nice, but you haven't gone far enough. Um, you haven't really captured what nature's all about <laughs> and about living uh, in harmony with nature is all about. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I mean, let's just take an example. Energy. What I ordered. Bert. Energy okay. is so is so basic. There's almost a one to one correlation between how you use energy and the living standard, basically. So one thing that will really impact energy was if we had convey funds into seeing how we can transmit energy around the world. Mm -hmm. Like it ought to be. I'm talking about that part of energy that we've captured for use. It is wasted. Essentially. I don't know how, you know, like it would have been like like he's been for the fiber, putting fiber optics around the world to allow communication the way we are doing now. It's possible with energy, at least in terms of phasing of energy and the use of it. That will bring down the cost of energy significantly. Mm -hmm. So, but we haven't put a cent into that. We put money into building things that are very local. But they are not interconnected. Yeah. And if we wanted to put them to be interconnected, we haven't built the composite material that is the best. Mm -hmm. transmit energy faster with the least of losses. But that would require that you have to put, you require peace in the world and require that you have to piece some, uh, so put some physical cables around the world or to think about the way energy was transmitted, attempted to be transmitted by Nikola Tesla. You remember the experiment of transmitting energy uh, via the atmospheric uh, layer, the upper atmosphere, atmospheric layer that he tried between uh, the US and Russia. You remember that of Tesla, Steve? About Tesla? Yes, he was trying to build a machine that would transfer energy, that would be able to convey energy from one place to the other using the earth yeah, and the yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. Yes. That, that was the loop. But it's hard to charge for that. And so the uh, the American economic um, empires had to shut him down. <laughs> okay. I put in the uh, chat, you'll see a link to a why we need to thrive and not grow. And mm -hmm. it will be in good shape. And I think it's my turn to read if that's okay. Yeah. All those who have attained high scholarly capability assure us that the only real education is self-education. They also say that this self-disciplining is most often inspired by great teachers who make it seem apparent that it will be uh, exceed, exciting, excitingly worthwhile to take the trouble to bring oneself to apprehend and then comprehend Variously pertinent data, phenomena, and derived principles. The intimate manuscript, uh, the intimate, yeah, the intimate manuscript records of all the great self-educated individuals show that they discern intuitively when and what it is that they want to learn. Therefore, they arrange to do so for four major strategies. The first is a self-conducted, the first is by self-conducting experiments, if they are scientists. The second is by going to those live humans who have educated themselves from direct experiences. The third is to contact through books 
those who have discovered and learned but are now dead. Fourth, they sometimes have recourse to the esoteric and often exquisitely valuable information contained within the word of mouth information system relayed almost exclusively from generation to generation by craftsmen artists. And we'd have to add five YouTube on there. But of course, it didn't exist back in, in this day. At heart, full, at heart fearful of losing their jobs, the tenured professional educators of today and all those are earning a living by teaching are relentlessly fighting video. Since it would damage their position to tell the truth regarding their, their motives, the tenured pendants rationalize. What the children need is the personal equation. What I've long observed in the, movie, in the moving picture world is millions and millions of human beings falling in love with female heroines or male heroes through knowing only their photographic images cast upon a blank wall. All the personal equation was and as yet transmitted probably a little more poignantly by electronics than would ever be feasible in ordinary personal contact life. After beginning to receive their home research lifetime fellowships and trying to to and trying the video educational system themselves professors and researchers won't protest any more about loss of the personal equation in, in education i'm certain that none of the world's problems which we are all pre-forced thinking about today have any hope of resolution except through total democratic societies becoming thoroughly and comprehensively self-educated. Only thereby will society be able to identify and intercommunicate the vital problems of total world society. Only thereafter, many humanity effectively sort, only thereafter may humanity effectively sort out and put those problems in order of importance for solution in respect to the most fundamental principles governing humanity's survival and enjoyment of life on earth. Richard, you want to read? We got a few minutes left here. I think we yeah. can go for Well, I find one result after another of the last century's critical past of now fulfilled relevant artifact interventions and developments demonstrating unexpected unexpectedly intimate interrelatedness and unanticipated synergetic eco-social productivity. Number one, we shall find that we do indeed have enough good life resources to go around. The computer will continually direct us back to basics. The computer will call our attention to the many relevant new potentials of the synergetic integration of critical path events. If we continue to use our resources metaphysically and physically uh, properly, there will continue to be ample to take care of all humanity, food, energy, shelter, travel, research, cultural development, inventive initiative, and all the technologies, etc. Obviously, the first step is to pay people the handsome fellowship to stay at home and say to themselves, what was I thinking about before I was first told convincingly that I had to earn a living by doing what someone else said I had to do. Then let them discover that their fellowship income will permit them to travel objectively to search and research and engage in creative or productive endeavors anywhere around the world. With complete freedom of choice, much of humanity will begin to discover that it loves to work at tasks of its own choosing, that it loves to discipline itself to demonstrate its competence to others, that it will compete with many to demonstrate its competence to serve on one of the multitude of production teams. There would be no pay for the work. It would only be like qualifying for the Olympic team to be allowed to do what you want to do. You would have to prove that you could do the job you wanted, do better than anyone else available to get onto the production teams. Permission to serve on the world's production teams will be the greatest privilege that humanity can bestow on an individual. There's no joy equal to that of being able to work for all of humanity and doing what you're doing well. It is difficult to match the gratification of not just crudely crafting a plaything for one child, which indeed can be very rewarding, but of producing exquisite somethings for a billion children. Activities of this kind are re-inspirational -inspira to a mystic degree. As with 
uh, all humanity, there would be no life support problems, whatever, for those in the production teams. There'd be no attempt to block automation to keep human muscle and repetitive selection jobs operative. If any individual wants to leave a team to have other experience or to serve elsewhere, a replacement would be found on the waiting list of others who want to take on the job. There would be the continued inspiration to invent more automation, to emancipate more humans from performing only sterile muscle and sorting functions. Those who are real craftsmen and are good at developing the tools that make tools and love their work will be the heart of the production team. There'll be no need to earn more because your fellowship will always get you more than you want. You won't be able to buy any non-consumables. You will um, you'll only be able to rent. If you're renting more than you can use, the system will call the excess, excess back. Wow. Um, um, this is interesting because uh, this is AI. You know, if AI replaces all the lawyers, which it looks like it's going to do, <laughs> you know, one of the big things about a lawyer is they slant their case to give them more work. And AI won't have that slant. AI just has the slant of solving a problem. I think that they've got to build into AI some greed or lawyers are doomed. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But Maybe AI I won't do it for as long as somebody doesn't capture AI. It's what? For as long as there's no gate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because there, there's, there's, I mean, that is a, the technology is there. But there are still gates. Right on. And to have gates, everybody got to agree that there's no more gates. And not to have gates, everybody has to agree that there's no more gates. Otherwise, there will always be some organization or some person that's going yeah. to put a gate to capture the added value or whatever that is created. Right on. Want to read yeah, he has more? a very appropriate last name, doesn't he? Gates. He put gates in the way of everybody else getting a chance. Bill, Bill Gates, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that, that's it. That is interesting. I never thought of that before. Microsoft is, is a gate, a giant gate. Yeah. Want to read a couple more, Richard, and then we'll have Manu read, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, those who love to teach and have something valuable to teach can discipline them discipline them as have themselves to qualify for membership on the subject scenario writing teams or on the video cassette or disc production teams. Great scholars will thrive, whatever their fields may be. They will be free to devote their entire time to the labors of love. Vast numbers will discover that they are earnest, capable, independent research scholars. What they have to say, if unique, can become the subject of a video cassette World Satellite Relayed Encyclopedia Entry. In 1927, the, the only plastics that we had were celluloid, a nitrocellulose development byproduct of explosive nitroglycerin. Celluloid was hydroscopic and highly flammable. Quite clearly, plastic materials of many kinds were desirable substance, substances as, as transparent and waterproof as glass but not easily breakable and of much lighter weight. We had in 1927 hard rubber foundation pens, fountain pens, and case in milk delivered poker chips, but nothing larger. Wanting better materials and looking at one's own fingernails, one could say that such and such a material is ostensibly feasible, so it will be developed. You then make a comprehensive list of all the desirable materials and you kept a dated list of the times of their actual accomplishment. With a list of all the desired technologies, you also kept a chronological chart of their successive realizations. You then compounded the information these observations were providing with your list of all the successfully advancing structural strength. And where'd we go here? I'm sorry, uh, mechanical workability. Yeah, and the mechanical workabilities. Um, workability properties of all the metals. You continually compared these development records with your list of desired materials, those that would make a possible solution of <clears throat> various living problems. 
such scientific research and engineering development of prototyping technologies to ever profit the total life support and accommodation facilities will be one of the most popular production team tasks. Interesting. Yeah. This is maybe a little bit of a diversion, but I was just listening to Ray Kurzweil. I don't know if you've heard Ray Kurzweil, but he's one of the first AI guys back in the old, old days. Mm -hmm. he, he started the, the AI thing. And let me just find a thing. You guys have heard of Moore's Law. Right. Um, he wrote, he started a chart. Uh, Moore was the president of Intel in like the 60s. This Kurzweil started a chart uh, back in, he, he started following computer development back in the first computer. And um, he pointed out that, that, um, um, that Moore came in the middle of something and was looking at his own business and um, that actually starting out in 1935, Kurzweil, Kurzweil did this chart like in 50 or something. Intel came along in the 60s and, and Moore was the president of Intel. But here's the, perform, the price performance of computation from 1939 to to 2021 and this is the idea that computer technology doubles every 18 months that was what moore's laws was but there was another law called wright's law that was actually more predictive moore's law was just based on a theoretical doubling of of uh, of chip capability every 18 months there's a thing called wright's law that um let's see here here it is yeah i think i have it here I don't know if you guys have heard of Wright's Law, but it was actually written by the guys who, the Wright brothers. And um, that's on exponential growth. It's over here. And um, Wright's Law was done by, um, oh gee, I'm not gonna be able to find it. So I'm gonna go over here real fast and just do Wright's Law. Okay, here we go. Let's hope it does it. Yeah, there we go. So this is one of the Wrights brothers. Well, I'm not fine. Maybe I've combined the words here. Yeah, I wrote it as, as uh, one word, and so it's giving me a problem. Here we go, including Wright's Law. Um, oh, if I could just find the Wikipedia. Anyway. It was up above there. I it was thought. above there? Was yeah. there a Wikipedia link? Yeah. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. it, it was, it, it Wright's law is actually based on production. So the more you produce a thing, the lower the cost gets to produce the thing. And so anything will have this kind of exponential growth. Um, I'm really frustrated because I actually have a uh, thing on Wright's law. I thought I'd hooked it to this. Wright's law. It's kind of like see, the, the, the rice law is here. I'm just I just get it here that the production cost decreased by a certain percentage each time the quantity produced doubles. There you go. And this is very similar to Pareto principle, um, but here's Rice law versus Moore's law. So anyway, I I you know this idea of this uh, the incremental nature of production and how things get better as we go. This is an old idea. And uh, Bucky's just jumping on it. And I think we completed there and we're starting right here. Mano, do you want to read for a couple? Any other comments or questions before we go? I think we have about another five or six more minutes of reading if you care to do so. Okay. Should I read? I think we're right here at the top of the page. Okay. The critical path already accomplished in the last 50 years makes it makes all this 
and much more immediately possible possible of development. It, it will not be possible to consider many of these strategies prior to the invention of this planet of certain, you know, prior to the invention on this planet of certain artifacts. For example, the rocketry accomplishment satellite or recent decades proliferation of computers will not have been possible without the discovery of transistors, which would not have been possible without the prior discovery and development of all the discoveries and inventing of all history. It was our possible in 1927 to see that such only now in 1980, physically possible capability were and will always be de desirable for society. With that being able to predict the discovery of transistors, chips, optical fibers, etc., it was easily possible to dream in 1927 that anything we needed to do could be done, never mind how, and to say to oneself, I want a device like a fairy one, which I need only wave while stating audibly the result I wish, and that this will be accomplished by sub-visible atomic behaviors. Whether this was to be done <clears throat> at the push of a button was of no real consequence. It is what we need and want to do that is reasonable and, and, and want to do that is reasonable that counts. My 53 years critical path has proven that I did not just state what was desired. I saw that it was my responsibility to undertake to design the artifact that will best produce the desired results. Then as first presented with new discoveries and development by others, I must redesign my artifacts to make advantage of the now proven additional technical capabilities. For a number of reasons, affair doors that will open automatically on a human's approach would be desirable. And so I specify such automatically open, opening doors in my 1927 uh, dimension house. I also specify that they should fall sidewise in accordion pleats so that the open door edge will not intercept the approaching human and cause a collision. My brother was an engineer at Peacefield, Massachusetts, staff of General Electric. A year after I had incorporated the foregoing equipment in the design of my proposed dimension house, my brother telegraphed me to let me know that a General Electric scientist had just invented the photoelectric cell, which opened in eruption of a light beam focused upon it will activate the door opening by miniature electric motor. As a practical and very reliable engineer, my brother considered my serious inclusion in my designing of technology that had not yet that had not as yet been invented to be lying to myself and others. The critical path concept has not yet been conceived and incorporated in engineering school curricula. So it's telegram read, thank God, the just event of the photoelectric cell has saved you from being a liar. You can get one from General Electric for $70. The accordion like foldable door also had not yet been invented in 1927. It was invented 10 years later once more saving me from being a liar. So it went with hundreds of my half century to come critical part artifacts inclusions in 1927. Therewith, I made the working assumption that wishes are reasonable, that wishes define the function of not as yet invented but highly desirable, desirable technology. It is in fact the as yet ungratifiable everyday needs that always inspire inventors in general. What you want for yourself may never be gratified. What you want for everybody, because you can see the total benefit that can accrue 
is usually reasonable and technologically gratifiable and to be realized possibly within your own generation. Wonderful. Wow. And that actually ends chapter eight and next week we can begin chapter nine. So congratulations for persevering. One of the things that, um, boy, this whole graph here about technology and the fact that this thing shows the best achieved price performance in computation per second per constant dollar. In other words, how many computations per second? In 1933, it was 0.0000017 or something like that. And then by 1940, it was 0001. Then by 1945, it was uh, 0.0010, then 0.0100, then 0.0100, then 0.1000, then 1.0, then 10.100, point 1000. And this is an exponential curve. You know, it marvels to me that when Einstein gives his theory of relativity, it's E equals MC squared. Where does the square thing comes up? You know, and we talk about the reverse square law in terms of how distance relates to the force of gravity and or radiation. And these squares are everywhere in, in everything. And yet here's our growth, squaring. That's, that's, that isn't a straight line. That is a freaking compound line. That line actually goes, it goes straight up, almost infinitely straight up. And the benefit of this, of this chart is it stretches it out over, um, over this chart. So I'm just, Bucky is talking about this. He's talking about our day and age and he sees it and, um, and says, hey, it doesn't matter anymore if it's whimsical. It's like having a magic wand. You just, if it's reasonable and people need it, it'll come. It's amazing, his insight. Okay, so Richard, how are you feeling and what are your takeaways today? Uh, well, I feel good about it. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's always valuable to go over some of Oh, any content, but this content in particular in a dialogue way with others and some of the things that get pulled out. <laughs> um, and uh, as I say, this this particular session with what he was talking about also ties in with something like AI because um, it's another kind of leverage tool that we use uh, that goes back to centuries ago when we found that if we did something with a stick or a shovel, uh, we could do more things than just with the hands. And we found, you know, um, Manu was talking earlier tonight about the fulcrum and how you can use a fulcrum in order to gain more advantage, all for the benefit of, <clears throat> of, of, of living well within the environment. <clears throat> so I suppose the optimist side of for all of us is, is that AI, and Bucky seemed to be predicting it basically, uh, AI is another one of those um, advantage giving sort of tools. And if we use it well, uh, it will advantage everybody. If we use it narrowly and proprietarily, <laughs> Um, um, it will it will blow up, and it will become more harmful than it is uh, beneficial. Um, and I suppose, as we talked at the very beginning, in terms of the world going to a hell in a handbasket, um, that's a very uh, practical and and uh, conscible sort of awareness that. We, we, I don't know who's a, who all the we's are going to be, but have to take into account because AI will be taken, as Manu said, uh, if 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 we can't put a stop to the Gates or the Bezos or whoever these other people are, um, it uh, it'll get taken over, um, and it will will continue to believe in hierarchies instead of heterarchies and continue to believe that they're the deserving 
people and the undeserving people, and there's the superior people and the expendable people, and and that applies to nature as well. Who cares how much oil we take out of there? It's going to last forever. Uh, well, forever is kind of uh, on the on the immediate horizon right now. <laughs> uh, anyway, so it's uh, and and as I say, I'm more and more conscious now of of uh, 226 coming and the paper that the students wrote all those years ago um, is going to be on the table to see what what really has happened um, and uh, uh, and and to get this you know this idea that if you gave everybody this working wage um, and then they found their own way to be, be contributors, then you get people willingly going outside their sphere and bringing in literature and language and the experience of others to improve on whatever they're doing. And, uh, and that's what I just recalled when I saw the few minutes of a student back in 19, 2004 talking about the experience in uh, the first two or three classes that I was teaching and they thought I was from Mars. And then when they said, I guess we should take, you know, take this into our own hands and, and investigate what this guy's saying and either confirm that he's a kook or realize that there's more to uh, what we're learning than the textbooks or the field has been telling us. And that's what they did. And they ended up saying, oh my God, this is, this, this stuff is worthwhile. <laughs> uh, other fields, other disciplines have something that can help us in our discipline. So I wish that the educational system and, uh, and the instructors and the students would, would, would see that that kind of thriving is the way to go. <laughs> um, thriving instead of just um, sometimes inconsequential growing. So that's what I'm taking away. It just, it's re-energized me, reinforced um, the idea of continuing to encourage this kind of thinking at our level or at other levels. Yeah, thank you. And Manu, how are you feeling and what are your takeaways tonight, today, feel, morning? I feel, yeah, I feel <laughs> quite good. I think it was a good, a good discussion. And then the digression to the building, repurposing was an interesting one. It also brought a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say twist, but a lot of things to think about, especially in regard to the problems that we're facing that we're going to face with the commercial real estate, you know, coming to term in terms of uh, uh, the financial cycle in 20, is this year or next year, Steve? It's next year, right? 2025, most loans. Mm. Uh, oh, right. This year, it's coming down this year. Okay. To put off so the it's going to be very interesting to see what it is. Now, yeah. from, from what, you know, we're getting there, uh, into the text today discussions. I take away like four words. I don't know if they make sense to me. Openness from Bucky. That is start with a macro. So, and then so talk about compound. And the compound is the basic for that exponential explosion or implosion that we're talking about. Because exponential can be that way or this way. Uh, Artifacts is our anti-entropic endeavor individually. What do we do? And it comes with self-discipline. And then the notion of at the nick of time, something happened <laughs> if you in this title like that. And to me, that is the manifestation of precision. Things always will work in a way that something happens. If you sat in a certain way, you know, doing a certain way. And 
and uh, and 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 uh, self discipline individually is very important. Self discipline, and I'm always kind of puzzled at why the what do you call self education movement hasn't caught fire in the world. Why the choices of individual are still in the majority, in the vast majority for the former schooling. Maybe both has to have to coexist for a better education of individu individual and better exchanges with groups. And then also, uh, and, and then, so, so I say self-discipline and accounting, and I'm, I'm very, very uh, kind of, not puzzled, but interesting the, the word chronophile. To be able to decide on taking on something and chronophiling everything that <laughs> could influence it and just acquiring that discipline. I call it, you know, kind of cosmic accounting in practice. It's very difficult, but it, that's the price to pay in order to get onto a certain level. And then uh, the last thing that was interesting to me is this right learning curve. And the aspect of it that that goes not against, but that remind that is not always growth. There's also a compression on the course in order to realize to or to or to tend towards sustainability uh, um, uh, sustainability and, regen and, and regeneration. There has to be those two. Mm -hmm. So, 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 uh, ephemeralization does not only play in terms of doing more. You're also doing it also with less. It's doing more with less. Those interplay to produce results. And those are my takeaways. Otherwise, I'm grateful and thankful <laughs> that we could have this meeting today. So, Steve, how do you feel? What do you take away? Well, I'm. I'm real excited. I, I think that uh, I could read this book on my own, but it's so much more fun when each of us share something from our own perspective. I noticed that I could have shared with myself about Kurzweil and his exponential growth chart. I've looked at it before, but to share it with you guys, I actually learned something about it when I did it. His chart was cost per dollar. So how much money they spend to run a computer and how many calculations they can get out of it every, you know, with each dollar spent. And so I learned some things too from my own sharing as well as from your guys. And so I love this perspective. Manu, you brought out that each person is a fulcrum, right? I mean, I'm sitting in my social environment and depending on where I stand and what I say, I create the leverage to have a conversation go one way or another. And, and Richard, you've been an example of that within your suicide discussions in your social sociology discussions and psychology discussions for 60 years you've been a fulcrum each of us can be a fulcrum and uh and um i have a quote here that i thought was really cool from page this is uh, in the last thing i think mana was reading this but some maybe i read this one i'm not sure but um, i want a device like a fairy wand which i need only while to wave while, st while stating audibly the results I wish, and that this would be accomplished by subvisible atomic behaviors. And that's exactly what's going on with computer chips. That's exactly what's going on with computer computability. Whether this was to be done at the push of a button, the, you know, the enter key on a computer was of no real consequence. It, um, it is what we need and want to do that is reasonable, that counts. So that's going to be kind of my takeaway. You know, we're a fulcrum. We, If it's reasonable, let's go for it. And my question to you, uh, Richard, is are, is, this, uh, is this article in a time capsule that cannot be opened until 2026? Or... <laughs> no. Oh, no. no it's, uh, um, I've, I have the original document. And then I have a a, um, a truncated, if you want, document that was published in an international journal for the humanities and peace. Um, 
and uh, I'd be glad to share. Oh, please share the, that. The entire I I would probably share the excer ex yeah. the excerpts movie. because the a lot of it has to do with Canadian welfare and economic development and so forth. But uh -huh. yeah, I um I do. I feel guilty though because you shared your daughter's uh, um, thing about observing without doing anything article and uh, about when she uh, visited South America, I think, Colombia. Chapa, the Chapas. The Chapas, yeah. 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 And I've only read like the first three paragraphs of that article, so I'm way behind on the on the resources you've been providing. But if you could provide that, that would be wonderful too. So. Well, it's six, it is six pages, Steve. Ah, the Chapas article is? Yes. Yeah, I have a pretty uh, good that just said it's six pages. I I started mm -hmm. reading it tonight so that I'd be prepared for this call. Yeah. And I got sidetracked, of course, again. But um, Yeah, well at, at some point too, uh, whatever sort of thoughts or feedback that you have, uh, I know um uh, our daughter would would love to hear that. I mean, she's she's a creative writer. She's writing the great American novel, <laughs> and yeah. hoping like hell the publisher, uh, a publisher, will come along and <laughs> and say, "Hey, I like it." Yeah. Um, but uh, well, I'm I think it's a requisite reading for a Wednesday morning, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I can to have it read before Wednesday because okay. That's really where you presented it, and that's I feel. I've <clears> it's really, it's really nice. I mean, I don't want to preempt your. No, well, I think it it. it's it really nice. Be good. You know, you're observing things. Yeah. Yeah. And it I was interesting. The lady, I can't remember at the end, that where she was always kind of passing to go to the, to the, yes, and she was there. She resisted that the incursion of the army yes yes sort of went nose to nose with him <laughs> yes and uh, i have a beautiful experience of that sort when again when i was in india and had a young social worker woman uh, they were cleaning up the uh faces in a playground in order to make it relivable again <laughs> And the it was Friday afternoon, and there was a big pile of it. And the city workers uh, came four o'clock. They're quitting, and uh, the neighbors were all around. And they said, "You can't quit. You know, we've got to have this out of here for the weekend." And so this young woman went to the foreman and stood her ground and said, "You're not getting out of this compound until you guys clean the whole thing up." And so she intimidated them and they did it. Then I got word back at the campus that she had turned her her uh, resignation in. And I went to her and I said, what, what, what happened? And she said, basically said, I broke the tradition of um, men and women. I broke the tradition of challenging your superiors and and I feel bad. And I, I, I was incompetent. <laughs> I said, well, that was probably the most competent piece of social work I've seen in years. And I said, but <laughs> you're you're going to be called into city hall, uh, like a regional city hall, and you're going to catch hell on Monday. And so I want you to be prepared to go in there and be contrite and apologize and do all of those kinds of things. And as soon as you walk out the door of that office, you go into a great big aha. <laughs> and uh, but it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful example of, of of standing your ground and not refusing, or refusing to let somebody get away with something that was really going to be damaging to that local community. Yeah. Right. By the way, I was going to show you this book. You know, Ray Cosworth. Oh, really? Yes, it's called Daniel. Ah. It's a very interesting book. Oh, it wow. Is, you know, it <laughs> is a chronicle of a super heroine and includes the companion book, How You Can Be a Daniel, 
a novel, a vision, a parallel history, a roadmap. Cool. That's the book. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Very wow. interesting. Thank Very you. Cool. Well, what a wonderful opportunity of sharing and learning. Thank you guys very, very much. And we miss Anne and we miss Susan, but they will be here. And Joe and um, and Julian, actually, the the uh, the video I put Love in you. about about thriving versus growing that came from Julian Julian. Mm, good. So he's he's his presence was known here today. So I'm going to send him a WhatsApp and tell him that he is. Uh, his uh, video got shared in a group meeting today. Okay. All right, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.